Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, I am ready for the event. Associated Press, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Marcia Dunn with the Associated Press. How do you hear me? Hey, Marcia, good to talk to you again. I've got you loud and clear. Well, greetings from the Kennedy Space Center, Kate. Um, good to see you, too. Um, I'll get right into my questions. You're down to three crew members right now, and I'm, I'm wondering if you're feeling a bit lonely or isolated because of that, and what's the latest on when you'll have three more crew joining you? Yeah, it sounds like it might be a little bit lonely, but it's actually not. So uh, I've got uh, two of my crewmates in the next module over, and we actually do a lot of work together during the day. So Space Station can actually seem like an incredibly busy place. Uh, we're doing a huge number of research experiments right now. Uh, so uh, it's definitely hopping up here. And uh, we're still waiting on word from our Russian colleagues about when uh, they're going to be able to have the Soyuz launch. But we are anxiously awaiting and looking forward to greeting our new crewmates up here. Well, is there any chance that your mission might be extended? And, and if so, what's the word on when you'll be returning? And how do you feel about spending potentially some extra weeks up there? Yeah, so we're still waiting to hear word from all of that. And, of course, the, uh, our Russian partners are going to let us know as soon as they have any word. Uh, when we launch to space, we know that we may be here for shorter than originally intended or longer than originally intended. So uh, we're prepared. Uh, the teams have quite a bit of science, actually, right now. So I think uh, nobody would mind too much if we got extended a little bit. We would be able to get a lot of research done. Well, you know, originally, um, and, and you may still be back in time for Election Day, but if not, will you be able to vote for president up there? And, and as an aside to that, do you find yourself keeping up with political news in orbit? Yeah, so I will be able to vote. Um, there's actually some uh, fantastic folks on the ground that get me an absentee ballot before I, uh, I launched. And... Uh, it got sent to my, my home address, and the absentee ballot address is low Earth orbit. So I think that's uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, it's, it's very incredible that we're able to vote from up here. And I think it's incredibly important um, for uh, us to vote uh, in all of the elections. And so, yes, I definitely do plan on voting. Well, now, tell me um, how the genetic sequencer is working in orbit. Have you noticed any differences operating the device in weightlessness versus on the ground? And are there any early results you can share? Yeah, it's working incredibly well on orbit, uh, which is actually a little bit surprising. Uh, things are very different in microgravity. You find any system that you work with up here to be uh, ju it just works differently than than the way uh, you would expect it to work on the ground and a lot of that's because of the way that bubbles behave in fluids or how fluids move across surfaces there's some really fascinating unexpected behavior but because this device is a microfluidics device and uh, it has such small pores uh, and then essentially a thin membrane it's actually pretty well designed for spaceflight. Surface tension takes over, and it's been working wonderfully. It's actually uh, a lot better, I think, than anybody expected. We've gotten uh, over a billion base pairs of DNA sequenced at this point. Well, I was going to ask you about that. That sounds like a lot to me, given that you started at zero. But if you could put that in perspective, um, for the layperson, uh, what's how, how many how many or how little are one billion bases of DNA? Could you compare that to something that we can relate to? Sure thing. Uh, I'll tell you. When I was an undergrad, I used to do sequencing one base pair at a time, and uh, I don't think that was too too long ago. So, uh, for for me, it's actually been amazing to see the the evolution of the sequencing technologies, the rate that we're able to sequence. Uh, has really gotten exponential since the initial human genome project. And so what we're doing with the sequencer on board here is the scale of easily doing a human genome or a mouse genome, or we can look at hundreds or hundreds of thousands of bacterial genomes if we're interested in the microbiome on board space station. 
Well, that sounds like it could have some real implications. Could you just mention the, some of them that pop into your mind? Yeah, one of the things that's really fascinating about doing research in this incredibly remote environment, we're in a remote outpost here, is the ability to track things in real time. And so right now we have to wait for samples to come back to Earth in order to do a lot of the analysis. So the ability to look in real time at, for example, our bone degeneration or our muscle loss or the changes we get in uh, intracranial pressure all the fluid shift we have upwards, as well as what's going on with the microbiome on board space station. Uh, you've got all these bacteria up here, uh, potentially, that are living in a completely unique environment, just like the humans are. And assessing what's going on on the microbial level could be very fascinating if we're using genome technology. Well, uh, you know, the SpaceX launch pad explosion is still pretty big news down here, and I'm just wondering, what were your thoughts when you saw the video of that, and what impact might that have on any station supply issues, or might it even put a crimp on the research and getting things down like some of your um, genome work? Yeah, so spaceflight is a tricky business. I mean, it is definitely difficult. And I think we forget that sometimes. We see launches and landings as routine. It's a huge amount of energy and dangerous substances. And that work is very hard. The SpaceX team is incredible. Uh, they are working on recovering from this. In terms of the research, we actually have so much uh, a buffer of research up here that we could go for quite a long time. We have a lot of supplies and materials. And uh, right now, m more work than I have hours to do in the day. So there's an incredible amount that we're doing on the space station that shouldn't be uh, too strongly affected by the SpaceX incident. Well, will some of your DNA work be coming down on a Dragon uh, soon or, you know, whenever it does get back up there? I mean, how important is that to get down on the Earth or is it just coming down real time, all the data that's needed? Yeah, so that's the incredible thing about the sequencer is that we're processing biological information up here, but we're sending it down as ones and zeros. So we're sending down just data, and that's got all of the information that we need to do the experiments. So we're not sending any samples back. We're processing them in real time and really using the space station as a real-time laboratory for high-throughput genomics. Well, great. Um, and, and, and one last question, if I might. Elon Musk is going to be making a major address next week in Mexico about his plans for colonizing Mars, making humans a multi-planetary species. And do you think you're going to be alive to see any of this come to light? Um, you know, it's nothing that's going to be happening anytime soon, but that's, that's his vision. And I'm just wondering what you, you know, whether you think you'll live to see any of this come to fruition. Absolutely. I am very convinced this is going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, I think it's incredibly exciting uh, where SpaceX is going, where NASA is going, uh, where all of the commercial crew efforts are going. Uh, we're really looking to um, maintain station as an orbiting laboratory, but we're also really pushing the boundaries in terms of where we're going forward with exploration. I think uh, humans are naturally driven to do this, and this is really the beginning, I think, of human beings leaving low Earth orbit. I certainly plan on being around to see that. You, what are your thoughts about going to Mars? Would you volunteer? I'd have to ask my husband first, but uh, I'd probably sign up uh, in a second. Well, listen, thank you so much. It's been a delight talking to you. Um, good luck, Godspeed on the rest of your journey um, as long as it may last. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the Associated Press portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from KGO TV. Copy ACR, thank you. Okay. Station, this is KGO TV. How do you hear me? 
Hey, I've got you loud and clear. How do you hear me? I am ready to speak with you. All right, we are talking with NASA resident and NASA astronaut Kate Rubin before she departs the IC ISS, heads back home here to the Bay Area. Kate, good morning, and thanks for joining us. We're so excited to have you back. Hey, it's great to be talking to you from the International Space Station. So uh, you're coming back to the Bay Area. You grew up in Napa. You're an inspiration for so many people around here. Tell us how it's going on the ISS, and are you even ready to come home? Would you like to stay there a little while longer? Well, I think the uh, glimpses of the planet that we get every day out the window would never get old. Uh, we, I could do this for years, uh, probably, and never want to leave space. There are, of course, things that draw you back to the planet, your friends, your family, your home. Uh, every time I pass over California, uh, sometimes we've had a, a few passes from the north, I look down the whole Central Valley and see San Francisco and think uh, it would be pretty nice to be there right now. But we are enjoying space. We're getting an incredible amount of work done up here. Uh, for example, today I just started a microbial monitoring system project, uh, took 200 pictures of Chile, and uh, we got a, a lot of maintenance done on the space station. So. Uh, we're definitely keeping busy up here. 200 pictures of Chile. I think a lot of people would be right on board with you. What, apart from the view, what are some of your favorite things about being on the ISS? So I think for a scientist, it's amazing to be in an environment where all of the things that you normally would expect in daily life have completely changed. So uh, things like it's just it's totally normal to float upside down. That doesn't bother me anymore. Uh, I watch uh, fluids behave up here all the time, and it's it's strange and marvelous and wonderful at the same time to observe what you think you know about the natural world completely get thrown out of order when you no longer have gravity acting as a main force. Some ordinary things must be difficult. I'm looking at your ponytail and I wish I could make my hair look like that. Tying my shoes was very difficult the first week I was here, but you actually developed these skills very quickly. What are some of the things you are most anxious for, and what's the first thing you're going to do when you get back home? Well, I have to say uh, I miss vegetables a lot. A nice salad uh, would be excellent. They're working on ways to grow plants in orbit, and I'm extremely supportive of that effort. Um, I think uh, there's a there's a a lot of things to be incredibly grateful for on the planet uh, when, when people are home. But it's also just such an amazing and a special time up here that uh, I'm, I'm really just truly blessed to have this opportunity to see the planet from space and to do all of these experiments up here. And speaking of that, since you are from the Bay Area, it's not often, especially for kids, that they get to see someone from where they grew up go up into space. So can you talk to them directly and, uh, you know, especially girls, young girls who may be interested in the science field? Yeah, I think for anybody that's interested in science, uh, my message is to pursue that, absolutely. I think a lot of times people say, well, science is difficult, uh, it's hard work, it's, uh, it's a lot of work to major in science and, or engineering in college, and uh, it is a lot of work. It, it takes dedication and perseverance, but it's also incredibly rewarding. Uh, the thrill that you get of discovery the joy that every experiment brings. I think it's a fascinating and an incredible career prospect for any young person. So I would say to anybody uh, that's in school, that's growing up, that's in California right now, uh, that they should go ahead and uh, just go full steam ahead for whatever they're passionate about. And you never know, you might end up living in space someday. Do you have any plans here, at least in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, to reach out to some of those kids and uh, talk to them about your experience there and maybe kind of encourage those young kids to get into science? 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, they're planning a lot of events in California, and we actually just did a downlink with my high school, Vintage High School in Napa, California. So I think we'll definitely be seeing everybody in the Bay Area soon. We certainly saw that. And on that note, do you want to send out a special shout out to anyone here at home? Well, all, my entire family lives uh, in the Bay Area, either in Davis uh, or Napa or in Vallejo. So I would like to say hello to uh, my whole family. And uh, I look for you guys every time we fly over California. Kate Rubens, great talking to you. Thank you. Have a wonderful trip home. Be safe. And thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thanks, ACR. Thank you, Associated Press and KGO-TV. Station, we're now resuming operational audio communications.